This episode begins the annual fall fundraiser. If you enjoy this show, you can help it to grow and continue to explore the edges of ecological design and what it means to practice permaculture in the landscape, our lives, and our communities by donating today. Give online at paypal.me slash permaculturepodcast or donate by mail. The Permaculture Podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dolphin, Pennsylvania, 17018. This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. My guests for this episode are Joshua Hughes and Amanda Wilson of Verde Energia Pacifica and Black Sheep Regenerative Resource Management. On the ground practitioners of permaculture engaged in restorative business, Joshua and Amanda are the founders and, respectively, the CEO and CMO of Black Sheep Regenerative Resource Management. Together, they've also co managed Verde Energia Pacifica, a permaculture farm education and resource center in Costa Rica for the last five years. They join me today to talk about what they're doing to scale up Black Sheep Regenerative Resource Management and to continue earlier interviews with Joshua about creating a compassionate future, the role of regenerative investing in saving and repairing the land, and the transitional ethics required during this period of change. Enjoy this conversation with Joshua and Amanda, and I'll join you again after. Now that we've sort of de-risked these ideas in our own way, and we've had time to invest and money to invest in the legal structures, we're here to share those things. We're here to share the legal structures. We're here to share the accounting methods and practices. And as we meet other businesses that are doing these things, we're, we've been open sourcing the way we do this so others can feel free to not have to spend a half a million dollars on legal. Right. That brings up another <laughs> thing that we kind of already touched on, which is like, you know, re-engineering capitalism, like working within a capitalist system and rethinking how that can function to our advantage and one of those ways is turning competition into sharing so we don't have competitors necessarily with within the regenerative community it's something that we really want to open source and make sure that people have access to to do the same thing or what we're doing the better if possible yeah and people uh, there's a huge demand for great products now foods in style Right. As they come up here, there's farmers markets tucked away everywhere. There's a few farmers markets on the way on a walk. I just took over to this restaurant, mm-hmm. saw so two different markets just tucked into town, and that's great. During the like the beginning of George Bush's time in office, there was a couple hundred uh, farmers markets of consequence in the U.S. It was like, like four hundred. Yeah, yeah, and it and now it's it's tens of thousands. It's like it's really thriving. So I mean, when I was born, we were in that era of like thinking food was all going to be coming from like technology pills. Like, really, like, oh, who needs to eat? I got a Jetson pill, like, really. And now we're like, oh, you know, I like broccoli, and, and I want it to be good and not be full of arsenic or whatever. So like, I think the food's in style and not just in San Francisco and Portland, Oregon, which is where it kind of was at when I left, if I felt like. And uh, so as, as we've gotten into this, I think what, we've, what we're hoping to do as we've scaled up is that we can actually meet people where they're at on price because even with our small co-op, when we vertically integrated things and we, we did the washing of the material and we didn't have to drive it to four different facilities to dry it and grind it and then extract it, just in-housing that saved all this money and then in-housing that and sharing sharing experts and sharing on-the-ground uh, workers and all those things brought costs so low that we're competing with Walmart's pricing and mm-hmm. with the small collective of three farms and a couple of companies uh, helping us moving th- move things to the States, a logistics company or two kind of in-house, made us competitive with Amazon's cheapest products, with regenerative certified organic. I think that's kind of the magic of what we've done is it's not just we've figured out, lots of people have figured out how to make great products. There's tons of amazing products and tons of amazing projects, right? Farms and stuff. But it tends to be like you really need someone to spend $8 on something they normally spend $2 on. And, yeah. and that's tough for working families. It's t- my family, I grew up in a wrecking yard cash poor you couldn't make that choice there was no choice it was just yeah. buy the cheaper thing I think that's a lot of time that's people's sole reason and like excuse for not buying what they know that they should is because they feel like they can't afford it so brings up another thing which is kind of changing the narrative of the relationship that businesses should have with one another like do we want to be people that are too good to sell at the most accessible space or do we want to have our products available to a huge range of people because people need those products and want them and they're good so I don't know what that will look like you know we're coming onto the market now but kind of an internal conflict has been you know selling on Amazon 
Amazon mm. is a is a company that's surrounded with a lot of controversy. It's not a company I feel super great about, but it's something that people really use. And so right now we want to make things accessible and make people be able to see our name and gain access to our products. So we're going to go with that and also go with other more regenerative opportunities as well. Yeah, there's there's a lot of cool online stores coming up, but yeah, there's this like a level of there's a level of we need to meet people where they're at, but yeah. without compromising on what we're actually doing on the ground. Exactly. And so, yeah, we've, we've made a product where we can sell something for $22 on the shelf at a competitive price, and we're all in like $4 on that product. So we've got great margins on things that, that are regenerating the jungle. So I, I think that's, that's my favorite part of the scaling up thing has been that it hasn't, it hasn't just been about making some premier product line. It's about we've got that, we've got that premier product actually in the box that's tested and you know we've been going through the due diligence of making good products which is expensive to, to learn but but it doesn't have to be just for a few people and we've spent we've been spending time in some of the places where people have the money to do those things make mm-hmm. choices and, but uh, where I grew up and where Amanda grew up you know people need to be able to just go to Walmart maybe and buy stuff so how do we meet that need without compromising I think we did it with just a few million dollars and we've actually that's given me a lot of uh, hope air quotes hope uh, because if we could do that with just a few million dollars, I'm wondering what's going to happen when we unleash billions of dollars into the regenerative world. I think it's going to be a really exciting time. I think there's going to be a ton of opportunity. There's, we've visited some projects in California that have blown my mind, things that are really unfolding quickly um, to deal with amazing problems like food waste and plastic and met people that are making fully bio, uh, biodegradable plastics. I mean, uh, compostable. compostable plastics you can throw in there and it really like just goes away. compostable. Yeah, like fish food straws. Yeah. Not like you know? compostable TM or, you know, right. like a lot of the compostable products. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I've had a pretty good dose of, like, hope delivered to me in the last few months going around doing this scale up and raise that we've been doing for Black Sheep. It's been good for me. I, I, uh, I don't know if you guys haven't heard of Bloom Distillers and Bloom Industries. The guy, uh, David Bloom, that wrote Alcohol Can Be a Gas. It's a book that's in, like, every... Every one of our courses, we make students read these in internships. I know just how to turn waste into fuel. And uh, his farm designs and his, his uh, feedback loops is one of the most mind-blowing things. If you ever get on a plane again, it should be to his place in Watsonville, California. Uh, <laughs> love it. I just, I've just been reading his book forever, and then we ended up in a meeting at his yeah, place the other day, and I was like, you're one of my heroes. <laughs> We're like, oh, wait, we have that book. Yeah. Yeah. You're amazing. Yeah. yeah. But, man, the scaling up's been really fun. We've been... We've been in sort of a legal always as we build these things, like making sure we've done everything right. Because when you let investors in to your your baby, like I, I grew this thing with my friends and family, and now I'm like, hey, we're gonna take a couple million dollars and let other people in. That's intimidating. So it took us a while to fortify those companies, get the right contracts so everybody's being treated fairly, um, and treat people that are willing to risk money on these things fairly as well. It's been a, a really powerful lesson. I sound more and more like a lawyer all the time. It's like, oh, does this help cure whatever? No, that en- that enables a healthy immune response. Like, like you know, I, I sound like a, a robot, but we're learning this other part of the game, which is, you know, where the rubber meets the road when you're selling products and you're making a food and you don't want to get people botulism or whatever, whatever, no, right, or E. coli or something. So it's uh, it's been a really uh, deep transition from just being like our permaculture garden to a highly productive permaculture farm we're gonna we're gonna harvest a million and a half pounds of turmeric and sachi inchi off our farms next season it's it's yeah it's, it's legit out from under and that's only in about 10 acres um, it's really productive uh, when you stack functions right all these talks you've had in your show about all these ways people are stacking functions yeah. when we scale that up it really produces in fact all of a sudden you're like oops I've made way too much stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a couple years ago, I was like, what are we going to do with 100,000 pounds of turmeric? And I was like, we're going to yeah. plant it again, and then we got to sell a million pounds next year because okay. to get 10 pounds for every pound you plant. And like, so it, it's been a really deep lesson in, in what happens when you actually get what you want and produce. Mm-hmm. You, you get a bunch of rotten tomatoes and you get rats or something. Like, that's, you know, bad. You know, you've right. got to be careful what you wish for. So, well, And it's fascinating right now because of what we're looking at for our commodity farmers because of how much corn and soybean are currently in the United States mm-hmm. because of the, the tariffs with China and mm-hmm. elsewhere that are just, just left going, what do we do? Mm-hmm. And because then of also the ethanol distilleries have been shut down. So we're no longer adding ethanol to gasoline, which does help reduce emissions. Well, that could have been a place to take all that corn as a feedstock for much of that. Mm-hmm. Well, now that's not an option. Yeah. So like I'm watching the way that some of these pieces are, are coming apart. And what I'm interested in and what you're saying and about scaling up is 
you're working on an experiment that is fascinating in the jungle, mm -hmm. but can we transition that then to a temperate climate commodity crop culture like we have in the United States, or what are the ways that we could start pushing some of those edges and some of those levers? Because it was what you were saying in the beginning about how it's more like a, the spreadsheet and a financial decision, because it was one of the conversations I had with Dr. Laura Jackson. She and I did an interview a number of years ago, and her role is in agriculture as a professor. And she's talking about how everybody within the supply chain is captured. Mm -hmm. So Monsanto has to sell their seeds yeah. and their Roundup because they're now stuck with this research they did 30 years yep. ago they have to pay for. You now have farmers who have to farm every acre they have because that's the only way that they can afford their combines and their equipment. Yeah. Well, they can't change over from corn because the equipment they have would cost them $100,000 to transition. Yeah, and millions and millions. All, right, yeah. or the cost for equipment or yeah. additional seeds or all these other things. Yeah. And so we have all of these chains that are caught. It's crazy crazy it's negative feedback. Crazy, loop. yeah, negative feedback loop. Yeah, and it's, I mean, some of the folks I know in the permaculture community who are like, I live on a 2,000 acre family farm. I asked my dad if I could have 10 acres to do an integrated project. He's like, I can't because it's $1,000 that my dad needs to make this loan on the yeah, combine. That's right. And it's like, okay, well, then how do we get people access to land? Yeah. And well, many. the cooperative build. Like, we, there were granges before. There were co-ops we did a, a while back in the U.S. We used to be much more small farms. The Monsanto-ism of everything, mm -hmm. the changing that, that's, that's fairly new, right? Like, this right. is a couple couple of decades of centralizing. Mm -hmm. We used to have a pretty pretty good cooperative system where we paid and we each had, we had machinery in areas and we'd bring and do that. We, it's gotten really off the rails because of, of collaboration or because of the big, uh, the big companies like Monsanto, and then we'd let those die. And we did. We stopped maybe researching the new crops or getting back to some of the older crops that we used to grow. I'm seeing a, a, some hope in the way that hemp's been kind of growing up in the West, uh, in both Colorado, Oregon, Washington. I'm seeing a kind of an amazing transition and farmers getting back into like the innovation of farming rather than just what the banks will ensure. But that, that crop has sort of a, you know, at the end of prohibition, you have these moments where things are still hyper valuable. The prices will come down on that and then it'll be a different game soon. But I don't know. There seems to be the, the power I see is going to be in collaboration. It's going to be in co-oping. And if we can get back into that, maybe we can bring finance in to reinvest in new machines and get back into that stuff and localize the food again. Because it's, it's a real it's a real pain when all you create is what eight different. What, what is the, U, the U.S. We in general we eat about eight different crops, something like that. And like that's really a tragedy because of all the like you said, the equipment needs and stuff. It's so difficult. Yeah. We're doing kind of a modular system where our plant can, can have you know, the basic things that are needed for farms to stabilize, wash, uh, dry, and package goods. And we're, we're building it in a modular way. It's small enough that you can adjust in different places. If it was just one big factory for all of Costa Rica, it would be very expensive to retool one thing. But doing it like we do, you could have 100 companies just like us in Costa Rica, and a couple of us could retool slowly and move into new products. And I think that that's going to be the way that we've answered some of those questions. Yeah, also, destroyed land is not worth a lot. Yeah. Once it gets to a point where you can't do much with it, mm -hmm. the value plummets. And yeah. that's how we were able to break into this, is we got the land that, let's say, like, palm oil people want, because that's, like, the last step before land is, like, completely, <laughs> like, falls apart. <laughs> so, Desertification. Yeah, so uh, that's, you know, the silver lining to all of this destruction is that if you're, you know, to answer your question of, like, how can we get people onto land, it's, they can regenerate that land, yeah. and there's an opportunity there. And it takes a minute, though, but in the tropics, there's an awesome opportunity, which is 20 feet of rain a year, okay. 25 feet of rain, so you have this opportunity. Yeah. If you can slow it down and build some OM, we're going to material yeah. going, and you can maybe get kickstart things. But, and, and you see in, like, Brazil, well, they're partially burning that land because they can't make enough off the last acres that have depleted already. So we've moved into those uh, what we call sacrifice zones, places where other people have left, and been able to leverage, leverage more, more money, or a little bit of money goes a long way because people have kind of left it. And then as you make that useful, then you don't have to take more anymore. You can, like, stop and pause. And Verde Energia, in, a few, in just three or four years, was back into really producing. Um, it took almost no time once the jungle started to function. Ten years later, and now it's, it's obnoxious. <laughs> It, it, it is. It, it's too. It's really productive. You have to be careful what you what you do. Like we want to do this. Yeah. Do we have a market? Like, yeah. We can go big on cardamom this year, but do we have a market? We can go big on this, but and so I think soil creation. Once we built that, then our co-op had this base to go from. But it did take investment. I'd hope that soon enough there's really good regimes around. Uh, and regulations in the crypto world so we can start coming up with more creative ways to finance. Mm -hmm. um, we've been dealing with the SEC and stuff, and it's, it's been okay because we've mm -hmm. been willing to spend the time and money. But most small projects can't afford that. And right. like us, like 
going through a half a million dollars of development in legal and accounting uh, is something that most small companies aren't going to be able to do. So would, uh, that's why we're here to share that stuff too. And you know, I don't know how much my lawyer loves to hear that, but we're sharing that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. And uh, and that that's kind of magic too, because once you can understand those things and speak that language, then you can start catching more investment. Mm-hmm. And there's trillions of dollars of stagnant money not being invested. Yeah, last time I looked at it, it was like $22 trillion yeah. or something like that. Sitting it's in the investing. banks of the big companies and the families that don't know what to do and they're scared. Mm-hmm. Interest rates are so low, so they have to just ball all the time. You know, like they, they talk about interest rates as being low to keep housing from housing you know, moving, right? Right. It's more to keep people investing in the stock market because you can't afford to save. So we're in a position where everybody's like forced to go high roller all the time because you can't just save. So I think we can create these co-ops and actually create like some safe tree trusts and safe like ways to save money again in slow growth things and then mix in this creative stacked function agricultural systems. But man, it's a big bear. It's a, it's a big issue up here and it's going to be, I don't, I don't understand how anybody farms anymore outside of the out of Fortune 500 up here. It's so big. Yeah. And while I was just touting or taught, I was just saying that hemp was doing some great things. I saw hemp and uh, uh, growing great in Oregon and some great examples of projects. I also noticed from San Diego to Seattle, all there is is hemp and and wine. It's like all weed and wine now, because they're racing. To, like, that's the only thing they can afford to farm. Those things right. are valuable. So we're gonna have to be careful that we don't just only have a few crops that people are willing to grow, mm-hmm. or it's just gonna be all cornflakes and weed. And Which is <laughs> funny though, because some of my friends were in the commercial marijuana growing industry for a while, and they're just like, I can't do it anymore because yeah. the commercial growers came in, and now the price per pound has gone from a couple thousand to less yeah. than a hundred, yeah. depending on what farm it's coming from. Yeah. So they're already out of the game. It, well, see, so. Oregon has gone through that. They issued too many licenses because the OLCC didn't understand that they should have charged, uh, like on every pound sold. They only, the only way they were making money on it was on the license fees. Okay. So they offered way too many licenses, and they crushed, they crashed the market. So they've kind of learned, and the growers there are adjusting, and it's gone from 100 back up to like 700 or 800. So okay. they're, they've, they're learning too. And yeah, I mean, when Philip Morris gets in the game, who knows? But just like there, we're foods in style nowadays. And all, any product that you're growing, if you're willing to do a high quality local version yeah. of it, there's a big consumer base that want to, to participate. Um, when I think of all the micro distilleries that didn't exist five years ago, they're, you know, I can drive from one town, two towns over, there's another one, two towns over, there's another one. None of them are related. Meat has exploded in Pennsylvania with yeah. meaderies everywhere competing on price point with large large commercial uh, wine growers. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. As far as scaling up companies go and bringing permaculture to the bigger world and bringing, bringing products to market and maybe even saying things like bringing products to market, which is hard for most permies I've met, we have to get over our own fear of words and attachment to what these things mean, what it means when you say the word markets or investment or capital or, or what it means to you know, go work with lawyers. And like, I don't know, this is all stuff that I think a lot of permies run away from. At least I was at one point. Right. Because nobody <laughs> wants to, nobody, I feel like, in our permie circle wants to look at a tree and be like, oh, natural capital, because that feels icky. Yeah. That's yeah. the language of people who destroy things. Mm. But it's a language They saw board feet. <laughs> yeah. But, or it has been the language of people yeah. who destroy things. But that's... That's the language that we we need to learn to speak that language in order to change that. Well, system. and help change that language because when I when you see a tree and you say natural capital, what I hear is is a system, not just a tree that's lumber. Mm-hmm. I hear the system around it. I hear the water absorption that it's doing. I hear the the organic right. material and the leaves that are falling and building soil over that years. So you can look at that tree as board feet, and you can look at that tree as a part of a system that's producing turmeric underneath it for several years and yeah. cacao mm-hmm. in its shade. And so I think we need to we need to capture this language. Actually, it's we need to take take it. Provide the, the correct <laughs> context. Yeah, with, and 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 it's a bummer that we have to spend all this time on our bottles and our product saying look at all the good stuff we do i wish that the big bad companies would just have to put that they murder on their products like <laughs> yeah. Shame. yeah it's a bummer <laughs> we have to we have to jump through so many hoops just to prove we aren't killing things um i would love it i would love it that we can keep setting the trend to where we're just like the given that that uh products should be healthy <laughs> and, yeah. and maybe we should make our certification just we don't kill things <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. what it is, though, when we look at this dialogue and, and looking at the communication theory behind it and everything, is that once this is changed, it takes 10 times as much energy to show your point against that negative mm-hmm. than it does just to spew out something that may or may not be true, right. to do something that's harmful, to account for our externalities, like all of these different things that you're doing in this process. Mm-hmm. It's hard, and it takes time, and it takes energy. And then the other piece about it also is it's like, 
a lot of permies I know just don't have any money. Yeah. Like, there is some generational wealth within the permaculture community that I'm aware of, but that hasn't gotten now... 30, 35, 40 years later to the people now who are making the change on the ground. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you have people who are, I mean, I was living on three, four thousand dollars a year up until recently. So my lawyer's three hundred and fifty dollars an hour. Yeah. He doesn't care how I live. He cares that I pay his yeah, bills. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, having those being being in a place to like save and have that money to go in and be like, I need to talk to you about IP law for a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. You know, can I send you my questions first so we can get this done as quickly as possible? Yeah. You know, and things like that. Ooh, so. Yeah, we found lawyers. Place, privilege plays a big piece. Yeah. In, yeah. Plays a big piece in all of this. And, and but then there are people, if we've been in this model where we're willing to, like, vest people in what we do and share in the equity of the things we build. So we've had everything from legal to accountants where they, well, that stuff's very expensive normally, where they're trading large chunks, if not all of it, for the equity of the program because they believe in that too. So I, I there are people out there that, like, our lawyer who've, had a good run in life, and now that he's, you know, he wants to kind of leave with more legacy. So we're going to have to figure out as permies how to act a little more like businesses. And we don't, you don't have to have money to run a business. You don't. You have to have a good business idea and a, fu- a functioning system. And if, if it was, uh, if it was about me having money for Black Sheep to work, it would be working because I've been living on like you did. Right. I've lived on two to four thousand dollars a year for the last many years while my company I'm you know pipelining all sorts of money into that so I I think there's going to be a level of like well who are we talking about we're talking about permies is it mostly people who just got out of college that are that are wanting to rebel from day one in life or people who have a little bit more because they're already 40 and they're selling their stuff and starting over or is it that your mom and dad like mine and and their generation want to help but they maybe don't have the bodies to help so we've learned to integrate the surplus wealth they have with the young bodies other people have and mix it together but that all required a cooperative ownership model, which even a lot of people in this in the perma world, I, I mean, have a hard time letting go of their baby, of the thing they love. And maybe we need to think about it in a more comprehensive, systemic way mm-hmm. and not just be like, I'm on my acre and this is, you know, I'm going to fight for it. Yes, but we were on our 20 acres and it was all good mm-hmm. until palm oil was going to buy across the road and ruin everything. We put a million dollars into already. So I, I don't know, I, I, when we co opt that neighbor farm became more accessible and then the next farm and then the watershed was better. And Mm -hmm. so I I think we're going to have to knuckle down and like learn this stuff. We're going to have permies are going to, we're going to need, we need business people to come into permaculture. I mean, I I know you're listening in their cars. I've gotten calls from people. They're saying, how can I help? I'm from here. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a man the other day who's, uh, who called us up and wants to participate. He's listening to your podcast. He's listening to the Anori podcast in his car as he drives around. He's a state trooper. Uh, in the Southwest, and it's uh, just like amazing that like a guy who like probably I would imagine was one of the ones that batoned me when I was trying to you know do anti-war marches in 2003, is now in his car listening to permaculture podcasts all day and and and, and trying to inspire himself and like and, th- and he's you know ready to retire get out of that game and, and put his energy into this. Well, so is the lawyer listening right now who's in his office or she's in her office and they're they're tired and how can they plug in so. Let's, let's do a call out to people that like that executive level and bring them into these permaculture projects and then trust. And then we have to trust. We're going to have to like let people into our lives. <laughs> yeah, well, and your business isn't in a vacuum anyway. Right. It's already your whole community affects the way your business runs. So I, I'm into vesting people. We have 150 people that own these together, these farms together. And now we're adding another 30 to 50 investors that are uh, uh, just maybe coming in as cash participants. Yeah. And it sounds like a lot to balance, you know, 200 people into, into projects or whatever. But there's really about 20 active people. That, and then we have a good management team that we've got to forge out of that group. So I'm looking at the things that may be considered a little negative as actually positive. It's like amazing community wealth or natural capital. But what is another word for that? Uh, human capital. It's, it's out there. So I, I didn't have any money either. I was sitting on the farm with no money. Right. When that farm came to buy the, the palm oil one to buy the farm above, above us, I had zero money in my pocket. Mm-hmm. And like three employees, like trying to figure out how to keep them paid. We just, we made it. We made it happen. We built a program that made sense. That's why it's another thing we're here to do. Let Take our paperwork. Go download our stuff right now from, from our uh, cap link thing that I'll give you an access to if you want. And take those documents and really study how contracts are working and mm-hmm. pay, cut and paste <laughs> and like start using these ideas. And then, then when you go to a lawyer, you have a contract already and go, can you just look over this and make sure it's okay? Right. Instead of, can you write me a $12,000 contract? Right. So I, I would hope that maybe we can all start open sourcing. And if you're doing a good business, if you've got a great co-op and you're out there listening to this, share, share your information with other companies and let's, 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 let's help make it not cost so much. Right. 
Yeah. And I mean, that kind of information is what I've been curating by having so many of these guests over the years, mm -hmm. having all these different diverse conversations, though ultimately then it becomes people are contacting me asking, <laughs> here are my questions, who do I talk to? <laughs> and it's sending them individualized stuff, but being able to collect this into something mm -hmm. that if anybody has any questions, it's like, here are lawyers who are participating in permaculture that yeah. you can contact. Here are people who are looking for projects to invest in, mm -hmm. you know, if you're able and willing to come to them with certain things. Yeah. You're like the permaculture matchmaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's 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 necessary because I think I think we're all in our. A lot of people are really passionate about the piece they're doing, right. and that's amazing. I'm amazed that people love compost toilets so much. I've met guys that just want to do compost toilets. That's it. They're nuts for them. They go everywhere. I'm glad they exist, and it's not it's not my passion. <laughs> you know, it's one of them. Yeah. <laughs> But so I, I'm finding like we need to step back a bit and take in some information. And I, I've also found a lot of people that are that are kind of the rebels that come down into my life. They're they're so rebellious. They tend not to, not everybody, not all the time, but to not trust information very much either. There's and and with Trump like destroying the fourth estate, we're like coming to a point where people are there's not a lot of trust. So I, I think something we're, we're building up. You have this amazing trust you've been building with people for years, and we need to we need to leverage those things. And you know people should. I hope we can learn to trust media again and learn to trust lawyers again. They're not bad. Yeah. <laughs> they're not. Um, it's just they're very expensive. <laughs> you know? But we've had pro bono lawyer work in California. We've had pro bono lawyer work in Costa Rica. And there's not just those services. There's also USAID. There's farm programs. There's money that can be gotten. There's billions of dollars of grants not being applied for right now mm -hmm. for all sorts of things. And, yeah. and uh, as as things become more apparent environmentally, it, it's becoming, there's more and more of those and we don't even know they're out there. So yeah, let's come together with more grant writers. If you're a grant writer out there, our permaculture people need you. If you're a, you know, if you're an executive at a business and you want to help, maybe you can, maybe we, we got an offer this morning from a guy that built a very large successful company to spend like eight hours a month with us. Like that's priceless for someone, for a company like us. Right. And, uh, and like knowing that a lot of very successful people, highly successful people, CEO types, they actually love having people to mentor. They, they want that. Their own kids maybe never saw them because they worked all the time and they, you know, they, they wish that somebody would listen. <laughs> I mean, it sounds funny, but I've, I've, I've gotten a lot in, the, in my life out of the, like those people that are a little more seasoned that are ready to help and they, they're just not being asked a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. People assume they don't have time. So I've, I've been asking lately. When I run into somebody who's good at what they do, I'm like, can I get some help? <laughs> like, I mean, really. <laughs> is that really how you're generating these contacts? It's yeah. just because of the work that you're doing and people who have come through and contacted you started working out through your network? Yeah. And friends of friends, yeah. And then LinkedIn, I never thought I'd use any, uh, <laughs> uh, I'd never thought I'd use any social it's media. funny seeing you on LinkedIn and sending me messages it was not where I expected you to contact me. I, it's, well, it's because I, I, everybody else uses like the Facebook messengers and stuff and I've never had a Facebook account. I've never logged on to Facebook. I'm, I'm, yeah, I've never done it and I don't, and so, like, I don't know what's going on in people's lives. I, my friends love kids, and I don't know it because they don't use regular email anymore. Right. So I got on LinkedIn, and I realized I can actually, like, see when people are on. And I was like, ah, I'm going to hit you now. <laughs> <laughs> I see him. So gotcha. our friend of ours that worked with us years ago, he, he works at LinkedIn, and he gave me a couple months of, like, an executive or a premium package or something. And through that, I can really see who's interacting with my profile. And uh, in no time, I've had a ton of really amazing connections there. And people don't seem to be afraid to say, hey, this is what I do. What do you do? And because it's people's real, real names, it's not just like Facebook where you could be hiding your real name, that there's, there's a, a level of accountability there, I feel, on that one. And I'm not trying to plug LinkedIn because right. I know people, I, I used to think I'd never sign up, but I got emails from friends. I was mad about yeah, it. Yeah, I right? LinkedIn. <laughs> I was like, who uses that? But I am flat blown away at the, the, the lack of like barriers between me and people now. I don't have to go through... Uh, no soliciting sign, right. which, which never was a problem for me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask anybody for anything if I know I can. Yeah, yeah. but I'd be like, get past the building security and then there, and then I have to hope a secretary would be honest with me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, I can go right to the person's uh, profile that's at this investment company or whatever, hit them up, mm -hmm. say, the, say something, be very personable, not like a, sending out a, I'm not blitzing people. I'm like, hi, I see what you're doing. This is what I'm doing. And I'm getting an amazing response, mm -hmm. but it's taking a certain kind of guts just to like be able to go and do that. And, and if, if you're running a permaculture project, you probably have some grit. Like, don't be afraid to pick up the phone. <laughs> and, and people are waiting. And we said a minute ago, there's a ton of stagnant money out there not being engaged in, in the world. And a lot of people have been burnt by philanthropy where they thought it would make a difference. And so they donated or tried. And it was just like a black hole of energy. And it wasn't really, there wasn't enough, I don't know, 
It was just donation based. And so I, I find that we don't want to just have those the only people that are calling these folks. Yeah, I've been meeting with people with uh, very wealthy folks, and they're, norm- they're, they're getting their phones ringing off the hook for donations, but not a lot of smart, small business approaches that really pay it forward and keep working. So I mean, we, we are, <clears throat> we're a little unique because we're vertically integrating, but if we were just doing any one piece of this, if it was just a farm, it's actually a pretty simple business setup. And I don't, I don't think people should be as intimidated to that as maybe they, they have been. And I know you don't like wearing a suit and tie. You don't have to. I think what's interesting <laughs> is that people feel maybe that they have to do it all by themselves, yeah. which is impossible. Oh, I don't know how they do that. Yeah, so just join a gang. Yeah. No, that's what <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut said, his last interview with David Brancaccio from now. I love that show. I love David Brancaccio. His, Kurt Vonnegut's last interview, he's like, you're, uh, David Brancaccio said, you're kind of a cynical old man. What would you tell people to do in this world when you're all cynical? And Vonnegut goes, join a gang. Like, get people right now. <laughs> like... Like, and I laugh my butt off to that. This is a 90-year-old white man saying, join a gang. But, uh, but I think it's right. You need, you need people. And, and if you're doing a sole, sole proprietorship, I don't know how you pull that off. That's tough. We, yeah, it, it, you, you feel like you have to be everything. And then something that's happened to me lately is as we've had this co-op approach, when I don't know something, it's very easy when you're already used to being modular and plugging people in to like say, hey, I don't know this at all does anybody want to help and okay. yeah no no but as a sole proprietorship you know you feel like you have to know everything so get people and have and be willing to like maybe have a collective ownership model um that's really important and then everybody that we work with is vested and cares and even if someone moves along to a new opportunity they're vested in your interests and they and it's their interest too and it's not there's not a lot of like on the way out the door you know making it hard on your company or something you know and having HR can be like the worst part of a business, right? Like, so and when you when you people are truly vested and treated fair, when they part ways, it's not nasty. Yeah, it's been really it's really really amazing. And having the permaculture uh, community, not just not just like hey, what is this? What is permaculture doing to make new farming techniques or whatever? I've been recruiting from permaculture. I've been finding the most amazing employees for all sorts of things, from engineering which people are always thinking permaculture is in the gardens. I, and I, 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 I wish people would stop thinking permaculture was a gardening technique. But I, I, need, I need permaculture-minded folks that, that are like mechanical engineers and chemical engineers. So I, I'm really enjoying the, the drawing on the amazing community that is permaculture for the businesses we're growing. And I think that's something that we should all be tapping into. It's, it's a great recruiting tool. Having a PDC with a six-month internship following it, which is what we do. By the end of that six months, we're, we really know somebody. We've lived with them at the farm. You know how it's gone when they're sad, upset. You know it's gone when they're not so happy that day. You know, and you you know somebody a little more. And then when when they move along, like I said, sometimes they'll come back years later and invest, or sometimes they'll come back a year later and say, "I got my degree. I'm doing this now, and I want to be your lawyer." So I'm I'm uh, I'm finding an immense amount of of energy to draw in there. It's been really positive. Mm-hmm. And the, the PDCs are actually have turned into kind of a little piece that keeps our farm functioning, keeps the teachers paid, the permaculture design courses, um, you know, keeps the staff on at the farm and educated people there. But more than anything, those courses are almost kind of a, just a service we do and just a cost plus nothing. It's a way to keep the, <laughs> the social scene from stagnating yeah. make sure that you know, we're always meeting new people and we don't lose our minds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you go live off grid, you know, we're all city kids who chose to go live off grid or whatever. Or, um, and I'm not from the city, but I'm from a big enough town where you could always like change your scene in a second. But when you live 40 miles from the nearest town and it's a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, it's, you have to have like a deep, I don't know, it's much more about having like good neighbor policies and there's all these things you have to learn that aren't about just having best friends. <laughs> and, and that... And, and you also, you, like I said, you get to quickly see what people are made of. So I've, I've found the PDCs to be an amazing place to, to forge relationships. Mm-hmm. And permaculture has been bringing me a bunch of highly qualified, fired up people mm-hmm. from all over the world. So, I, I, and I, I wish people wouldn't just say permaculture for gardens. <laughs> I, I, and people from cities will probably say this to you before, right? They'll be like, oh, I'd love to do permaculture, but I live in a city. I'm having lots of conversations about what's more, what makes more sense. Do we practice permaculture inside of a building with solar panels and solar grade LEDs, or do we try to farm on the roof? Yeah. Being able to cl- control climate and things like that, and it's yeah. left going, well, maybe the technological portion is a better solution. Yeah, it depends where you're at. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it depends what your problem is in your area. And uh, yeah, just let's just, more inclusive permaculture is great. And uh, a lot, when people leave our courses at Verde, they tend to not write 
anything about agriculture and what what it means to them. It's great. Our teachers do this thing at the end. What's what's it mean to you? And it's like a whole day after after all the presentations are done. We normally do a talent show. If you have to do something goofy in front of your community, is that a tradition that all permaculture courses? Are I'm not sure. Or, or sing a song, tell a story. There's usually yeah. something at the end that's just supposed something. to be. We just do. You can do anything. Song. One guy just showed us how loud he could scream. It was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but other people are like amazing ballerinas but after that we had people like sit down last day and just like what does permaculture mean to you now and we see what we how good we, did we do at explaining this and it's mostly the answers are like way to change my community way to govern society way to fix the oceans like it, it's I'm glad that people are getting a bigger view of it all the time some of the teachers we've had the honor of hosting and working at our farms have uh, by having them engaged there and having a good opportunity to be a teacher, they're able to stay at our farm year round and then apply this stuff, which yeah. is almost, which is amazing. So create an economy that really works with your place. We didn't want to be an education center in the beginning, but it happened. And maybe it's not the long term goal. Uh, Twenty years from now, do I still want to be doing hospitality? I don't know. <laughs> maybe not. But along the way, we were willing to try those things, and those things turned into amazing opportunities. So I, I, I like taking risk, and I would say you probably. You probably shouldn't be too scared of risk if you want to scale a business up. Probably mostly just risk of your time or your your soul, <laughs> your, your sleep. But uh, but we've done it because of a team, and I would not, I would not be sitting here with a smile on my face if I was if I was chugging along like I was ten years ago at Verde. Uh, it, it took finding a team that would do it, and I can't say enough praises to Amanda and Sarah and the young people that decided to give up like I did, give up like these years that you should be should be quotes giving your all to the the piling up of wealth mm-hmm. well we went down there and did it you know piling up of, you know building trees and and or planting trees and and we building fields and soil but you know what happened is a group of 10 of us really dedicated hard and over a few years we created like three million dollars worth of uh, biological assets between trees and soil mm-hmm. and highly productive stuff that we couldn't have banked that much cash had we gone and worked and and tried to save so it seemed like a sacrifice but biological assets are very real, and um, things like wood break, you know, last. Ben Falk does a breakdown of that, either in one of his talks or one of his books, where he's like, mm-hmm. how much does it cost you to plant an apple tree? How many apples do you get from that? Yeah. What if you invested that, you know, $20 in a tree today, $20 in uh, the market today? Yeah. On average returns, that tree is worth more because you will eat more apples from that tree over your lifetime yeah. than apples you can buy with the $20 you invest. Yeah. Inherent value, too, right? Yeah. yeah, that 20 bucks, even if it did go make you some more money, what did you put that money into? Is it just paying forward in like a, is it musical chairs? Because most of Wall Street is actually just musical chairs. Nobody's actually, most, most people aren't making money on Wall Street except brokers because they make money every time you do a transaction. But us investors are just passing along the hot potato until somebody loses. And it, that's a weird way to invest. Now, I get it. You've got to protect the money and time you saved. Like when we talk about money, I actually very much now that I've lived offline so off grid so long, and it sounded like you did living on so in a, with so little for so long, you probably understand the value of like a thousand bucks. A really like a lot. If there's a thousand bucks in your bank, you're like, whoa, okay. I can, I can. Well, not set, but you know that you can make some decisions for a while or whatever because you've gotten used to that. And a thousand dollars to me 20 years ago in my corporate life, that's. That's a rounding error, maybe in a month's bills or something. If you, if you, you know, it's like when I was in IT, that was a good weekend. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. My ex-wife used to make more than a thousand bucks a weekend belly dancing, and and then we went to making a thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So, uh, but I think learning how to how to appreciate that money is actually stored up energy and time, it's stored time, and that if somebody went and earned it and they've they've stored it their whole life, and we're asking this person that maybe has some means to invest in our permaculture project. Are we asking them to do it and we're, we don't really have a good enough plan to show them how it's not just going to be gone? We're asking them to give us that, those months in their 20s when they saved that money right. and, and stored that. Well, they could have taken that month off instead of throwing it at you and you losing it. You know? So let's make sure we have real business plans that, that, can, that can be the best chance possible to not squander someone's you know, time. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I think maybe maybe we think about money kind of abstract in a big way because oh there's trillions of dollars to spend. But when you're when I'm talking with someone right now, an accredited investor, they're normally someone who just has like one house that they have rental, and they make 150 grand a year or something, and they're they're they qualified as a accredited investor because of their asset. They don't have four lawyers and three accountants protecting them. Right. They're not like the trillion dollars of stagnant money not being invested. They're your friend who happen to do good well and buy a house once that, that you know I kept it or something so it we're really you're when I'm asking someone for a hundred thousand dollars for black sheep to invest in us 
I take that. It's a very, I'm like honored that they do it. And it may be the first time, many of our friends, it's the first time they've made an investment mm -hmm. outside of just buying a CD or something or, a, you know, throwing into a 401k or whatever. So I, I, I think we're, we're going to have to have really good plans. If you can't, like, I think a lot of people I've met that have, like, oh, I have this great business idea. No one will invest in it. I'm like, flush it out. Like, let's really see. Why won't they invest? Is it because it's not, you haven't done the research needed? Because it's cost us, what, several months just in market research for one product or two to, like, be able to tell an investor and I'll give them an answer when they ask. So I'd say scaling up means you're going to have to scale up your game and make sure that you're, you're not just a, a dreamer and it's not just like a donation thing, unless that's your model. But yeah, I, I think it's been, over the years, if I, I wouldn't even have known what to ask for five years ago from serious investors because I was letting them into like my, a project that didn't yet have its, all the details worked out. So again, you say it takes money, you got to spend money on lawyers and accountants, but maybe not as much as you think. And um, while, you know, $350 an hour is killer, in Costa Rica, getting legal down there for, for $500 a month, I have a lawyer that works for five hours a week. That's been another lever we've had, being in a country where these things are a little cheaper to do. So that, that offered us an opportunity to get over time to do what I've learned they call de-risking. <laughs> I would just say I practiced, but we, we were de-risking. <laughs> and then, you know, what I've been learning is all money's not the same and make sure you find the right partners. You know, if, if you get the wrong partners or you don't have contracts done right, all, all the great ideas could go out the window when somebody a little more savvy than you, the better lawyer, even if you're spending 350 an hour, you may be spending 650 an hour <laughs> and you miss a comma and you lose your business. So it's very, it's very important that uh, people are prepared for what it means. We, I told you we were entertaining a few years ago doing like using like crypto model, a cryptocurrency model or blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, something to, to do like a fundraise, but the regulations aren't really there yet. Right. So I'm actually really glad we didn't push forward with that. What it forced us to do, and we even considered that, was start looking deep at the details. Mm -hmm. And just about every, I'm, I'm imagining just about every, whatever those were, ICOs or whatever, uh, this little corn offerings, yeah. I'm, I'm imagining most, most of those people probably belonged in jail. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like they, they, or they were, the securities violations for real. Yeah. So I've, we've taken it very seriously and, um, and set ourselves up with Black Sheep after serious investment of time and money, but set ourselves up to like be positioned like a Fortune 500 company with permaculture at our base. And that's, that's really inspiring to me to maybe as a legacy that Verde could leave in this world is that permaculture can be on the Fortune 500 markets one day, you know, mm -hmm. that we can be in that same caliber and trust mm -hmm. uh, as the companies that, I mean, that used to kind of pull through for us. But, yeah. you know, I think, I think those markets maybe weren't the worst ideas that we collectively invested in some things and we collectively took some risk. So uh, we're, we're collectively taking risk, and uh, it's a good kind of risk. We're fixing watersheds. As these trees are growing and we're wondering if the turmeric's going to work, if the turmeric doesn't work, the other crop works next to it. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a deep dive into, and deep research into all these things that we preach as permaculturists. Right. Oh, oh, look, this garden doesn't have enough stack functions. I would do this, this, and that. Well, what would you do when you produce? Right. What would you do if uh, an investor showed up and said, what are you doing? How would you explain it? Right. So, like I, I challenge people to... Well, please call me, call us. I, we're willing to meet and talk and, and share this. I, I just went to a meeting a few minutes ago that had nothing to do with, uh, with us raising money. It was somebody who's on the same path as us. And I'm really excited to share and collaborate on this. So and when people want to scale up, don't be afraid to call me. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of crazy, I guess, to put my number out there to the world. And somebody said, you put your number on the podcast. I was like, yeah, I did. And I've got nothing but positive response. So thank you, world, for being nice. Do you want to share your number again before we draw this to a close? Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> Sure, 503-898-898-2163. Uh, no, you can find them on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. find me on LinkedIn. No, but uh, I really want to help uh, make sure people can talk. They want, we'll, we'll think this through and make sure their ideas are really really fleshed out. I know maybe we, uh, we've been talking about this for a couple years. We talked about this maybe two years ago about what we were planning on doing. And a couple years before that, we were talking about like what it meant to think about investment different. And pretty much all my expectations for this have been met. I've, I haven't found myself having to compromise at all. And I've, like I said a minute ago, I've been refreshed at how much even the traditional business structures can work for good mm -hmm. if their directives are right, if their algorithm is programmed right. And I've never been one to be afraid of the AI when it comes to machines marching down the road like Terminator. I've been way more worried about the really bad contracts we've had at corporations. And 
when, about the time that corporations were decided that they were people, the end of the 1800s, is about the time everything started to go off the rails because corporations don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. And, they don't uh, die. And, those, and those algorithms <laughs> were set forth at that moment as living entities. Mm-hmm. And, and those algorithms are destroying the rivers, not, not robots, not Arnold Schwarzenegger's robot. It is an algorithm that doesn't care about clean water. So as we write these new ones, these new ways that we're going to make society work, we're going to have to do it in business, not just in the government. And I think a lot of people are always hoping government will change things, but, but I, I can actually change more in my own business, and it affects me every day and my employees every day rather than just uh, a vote one way or another every two to four years or hoping that they can sort of compromise their way to some better idea in the future. Well, our business can use money better. Our business can figure in externalities and, and make sure that we're, we're price pointing right because we figure in the river being clean. Um, and that's something we get to do every day now. And it's, it's been empowering. To, as, you, as we got a bigger and bigger business with this permaculture ethic, I feel like every decision we make now has more, it echoes louder and longer because it's, 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 like it's changing the supply chain. It's changing where millions of dollars are flowing. What we spoke about a few years ago that we were developing with agroforestry uh, is now creating several million dollars a year in, in surplus off our farms alone. So if, if we can do that, and we're not, and none of our people, really, a couple of us now, experts we've hired, but none of our initial team like knew anything about agriculture. I man, I would love it if, like you mentioned a minute ago, that family where the younger guys getting a couple acres from his dad or something or hoping to. Mm-hmm. I would love it if, some, if more and more permits start coming from the farming world too, rather than from like the college campuses and starting a farm because right. we're way behind <laughs> on those techniques. But we're also not locked into bad habits. Mm-hmm. So you know it's a, it's a it's a push and pull, but I would uh, I would love it as as we grow um, that the people that are already into farming would start playing more too with this, and I think that's that's always already happening, but mm-hmm. but it is, it is a risk, and and it's not for them it's not as traditional. I had a great talk with those guys out there. The uh, if you guys ever get to Costa Rica, I know you don't like to fly, but. Maybe you could take a banana boat down there. <laughs> or maybe just fly and yeah, you know, just plant fly some it. trees somewhere. Well, yeah, well, yeah, for sure. You guys can plant. I think it's about 40 trees for each person on each flight. That's about what it takes. If you fly to Costa Rica back, you need about 40 trees a year okay. per person. So it was kind of 80 right trees for you. Both ways. Both ways. From, 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 it was from California to Costa Rica and back. And they were, United was planting like one tree per person. And I was like, it's 40, it's 40 trees per person. And it's something we've had to do as we're, we've had companies coming to us wanting to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, can we pay you for storing carbon? And, but, and they want to they wanna give me like a dollar for a tree or something. Yeah. And I'm like, you guys have a really weird expectation of how much needs to go into this. And it's because they've, cause kind of, they've been this model of just like counting seeds. Right. But does it live 10 years? Does it get to the point where it's really pulling up mm-hmm. uh, or really uptaking carbon? Yeah, no, I've, I've, we've, we've toyed with that over the years. We've made people plant trees every time they flew down in the beginning. I was really militant when I first got there. <laughs> I'd make them, make them do it. Now, now I'd actually rather, most Americans, if they show up, I'd rather them give like 30 bucks to my neighbor who could, who could plant like 200 trees in the time it take you to plant three. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, we've got a pretty good program set up to where we get to plant one. For every tree we plant that we use for, let's say, building material or something, uh, we get to do about 10 trees for just nature. Okay. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a great thing that every time we get to do something economic, and every time I talk about cutting a tree, by the way, I was locking myself to warehouse or trucks before I left the States. Mm-hmm. And for me to cut a tree down is, in my mind, is like it's opposite of where I would have thought it was 15 years ago. But now I've learned to like use to have this, that maybe this is the only kind of tree that'll grow in the clear-cut jungle. And as that tree grows, it'll create the scenario needed for a real jungle to be in its stead. And that, that took me a long time. So Amanda, Amanda doesn't really love it when I say this, but I went from uh, chaining myself to log trucks to lovingly logging. I just hear you say it <laughs> a lot. Uh, no, it's, 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 it just came out the other day, and I was like, I like that. I'm a loving logger. No, but I grew up in, around loggers, and it wasn't their fault, the policies. And like, right. we, a lot of times, the people on the ground get the blame. And in yeah. Oregon, we like, you know, in this, when I was a young, young kid, we had moments where, like, protect the spotted owls. And it was tearing jobs away from my community. And when we finally did put through protection stuff, it got rid of all these local mills. And then Warehouser came in and cut all the trees down anyway. So it was like, it, you sometimes, you know, you're, you're causing... You're causing more problems than you realize. So it, it's been a really deep dive and really uh, then getting into farming, getting into forestry work as an environmentalist, as a diehard activist, a real gut check on reality. 
and what my neighbors like need to survive now and how to, how to integrate and slowly, uh, not slowly, hopefully, but how to transition without destroying people's lives too. I really, when we talk about changing things and you know, you, oh, wipe out coal or something like, okay, right. how many people are working in coal in your state? What's that mean to them? Mm-hmm. So it, it's uh, it's been a deep lesson and constant reflection on on what it means to apply these ideals that we've all talked about in the permaculture world. We open those books and then what it means to my neighbor when he like doesn't have an extra nickel. How do we transition that? So we will hopefully figure out through the co-op model like we've done is that we've, maybe if our neighbor could make five times more like he should or she should, then they could afford to invest in their own land for a minute. So coming up with some unique or dynamic ways to do this that aren't so maybe direct. There's a lot of bobbing and weaving mm-hmm. to fix to fix the environment. And in Central America and South America, there's people die on the front lines all the time because like, you're not just doing something good when you change. You're typically getting in the way of a bad idea like, like what you're seeing in Brazil, like these people that are willing to burn the jungle for cattle or something. Um, they're pretty serious men. <laughs> so in our area, there's a, there's a delicate dance you have to do when you go to a community meeting and talk about the cattle or the grass or the erosion because three or four people there, they need that. So it, it's been an interesting dance. Why well, Amanda that? tried to tried to go and do some protesting and like figure out what's going on. And <laughs> she had a very big, strong woman telling her she's going to beat her up for getting yeah. away from her job. So you like realize that you go as like a 19 year old to go protest something and you're going to take this job from this poor man that needs right. it. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is that you have to you have to offer people solutions instead of just screaming right. no at them and blaming the people who are on the ground who are just working a, a shitty job. It's, it's not their fault. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the things, though, if we... Oh, I don't know how far I want to dive into this. Um, <laughs> but it's like David Graeber writes about bullshit jobs and about how we have all these jobs that people do because they have to be there. Uh-huh. And these are conversations that we have all the time is about, like, how many problems are there in the world that we are self-creating yeah. that we're now cr- trying to find solutions for that actually make the world worse because of a problem we created maybe 20 years ago. Sure. And how does all this tie together? Now with where we are, it's um, like from improv or storytelling, you, it's, you never know somebody. Like I, used to, you, I knew a lot of people used to go, no, because... And like it was just instantly shut it down. Mm-hmm. But then in like um, community storytelling and things, there's this idea of yes and. You take an idea and you run with mm-hmm. it. You build on it. You, you move on top of it. And it's interesting to me because a lot of my work over the last several years has been in organizational leadership and development. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is about when you have a problem finding a solution. When you're an employee who has an issue, you never go to your manager or go to somebody in charge and just go, here's my problem and lay it in their lap. Because they may, may just give it to HR and decide you're too much of an issue and get rid of you. Yeah. Somebody else yeah. it's easier. Um, <laughs> or you could wind up showing up with a solution and your boss can go, well, this doesn't work for me, but this does. Thank you. Mm-hmm. We can implement this. And now you have something that gets you closer to your ideal mm-hmm. by having a solution. Yeah. In writing policy before, um, getting local chickens in the township I used to live in was coming in and going, like, here's one of the basic chicken ordinances that somebody has. Can you adopt this? Mm-hmm. They looked at that, compared that to their livestock policy and we were able to write it up and I think it was like three months and it was changed. Oh nice. You know, and those kinds of things we can all engage in, yeah. but it really is that take some time, stop, reflect. Yeah. You know. What's what's the first principle of permaculture? Observe. Oh, observe, yeah. Observe, observe and interact. Observe, yeah. And I mean if we did more of that, spend months getting to know your neighbors. Yeah. Think about the problems that you're engaging in and how you can solve them. And then when you step in there, you can have a lot of answers for people. Mm-hmm. You can step in as an expert. Yeah. You can go out and you can read the two or three books on composting toilets and the policies <laughs> that exist around them and come into your meeting and go, I think these are important because they yeah. save water and we have combined sewer runoff in our community. Yeah. And, and we, in my situation, we had enough time to like build some and see what worked and what didn't and what was clean and what wasn't. And, oh, I see why you wouldn't like this. Look at that. There's flies in the kitchen. And no, but, but really, uh, having, having time to observe and practice and uh, experiment to um, put you in a position rather than just coming like to come into your uh, like I can imagine myself when I was really becoming an activist at first I was always just coming to the party and just saying no this like you just said and permaculture has, has dri- drilled into my head the word and instead of the word or mm-hmm. and and so it's an and and an and right now to get us out of this hole <laughs> that we've dug yeah Every time I would, I used to just say or and I got in a position where I was personally feeling like a hypocrite all the time. And it doesn't help us at all if we all get paralyzed by our lack of being able to do everything at once. So, so I'm really, I'm really uh, excited to walk into my community meetings and say, and, 
let's do this and let's do that. And it turned into building water systems with neighbors and then they had clean water and they realized you're there for them and they're there for you. At, at, at our farm, the, the magic was never in something that we really figured out, you know, some book, something that we thought through. And uh, the magic was when I brought my daughter down there and raised her with my neighbors. Mm-hmm. And, and she, she lived as as they like took her in immediately, little blonde haired blue eyed girl. And, and you know, she learned Spanish faster than me. <laughs> and she integrated me into the neighborhood, having uh, trusting in my neighborhood as family and as neighbors. That, that went a long way. Because well, you're no longer approaching as like a person who has something to say and I want to tell everybody how to do stuff. You're yeah. just like the guy who lives down the road. Yeah. He keeps building those compost toys and they keep failing. But it looks like you got one now. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> No, but I, I'm really, uh, I, it's funny we talk about compost toilets so much because I, I, I probably talked about them about 100 times in the last three months here too. People are always asking me what answers. And I'm always curious how far their community is adjusting and how progressive they're being mm-hmm. by asking if like those kind of things are allowed. And uh, I find, um, thank you for doing the work on the chickens because you can really feel that in towns where, it's, where they've done that work now. Mm-hmm. People are proud to have chickens. Their yards look better, yeah. look more like gardens rather than just lawns. <laughs> As always happens, though, we run out of time. Oh, yeah. And so before we draw this to a close, is there anything else that you want to add to this conversation today? Because we got a whole lot there. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, it was really great sitting and talking in person. Normally on the phone, we've kind of like had a, I, we kind of feel, I feel a little pressure to like just be on all the time. It's really nice just chatting with you guys. And um, yeah, I, w- I, would leave, I would leave with a message of, of hope. And, I, and I've been somebody who thinks hope is a bad word in my life. Um, I always just like to do things rather than hope, but uh, I have a lot of hope right now, in, in even in this time of turmoil, even in this time of the news being very tragic and sad, mm-hmm. I have hope in organizing. I have hope in the slow, methodical work of working with my community, and I would hope that we can organize faster around things that really matter, so let's do it, and uh, we're here as a resource as always. Uh, our crew keeps growing and getting bigger, and there's more of us to, uh, to help. And Let's be really gentle. I'm from Central America now, and uh, please, world, be very gentle to what we call immigrants or refugees, because they're our neighbors, and, and uh, they're my neighbors in Costa Rica, and it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's something that's very powerful to me as I've been up here this time, to see like, the divisions in this time of this election that's coming up, mm-hmm. is uh, don't forget that we're all, we're all in this together, and be gentle to people that need help, and be kind, and it's not a crime to leave water in the desert for people. And please, more people do that. Let's take care of our brothers and sisters from the South. I just want to say thank you. And that was Amanda Wilson and Joshua Hughes. Find out more about their work at weareblacksheep.org and verdenergiapacifica.org. You'll find links to those and my earlier interviews with Joshua in the show notes. The work Joshua, Amanda, and the other members of their team, farmers, and friends are doing through investment and direct commercial action reinvigorates farms, and saves the land around them from further destruction and devastation. Listening to this story, I'm reminded that we can all engage in the act of restoration as permaculture practitioners by acquiring a piece of land, if we're able to do so, and use the skills we gain through understanding ecological design to build soil, restore functioning ecosystems, and create designs that benefit people and the other than human. If we don't have land or the hands-on skills, but do have the economic resources, we can donate or invest in land restoration or management projects like Black Sheep Regenerative Resource Management. We can buy the plants for our yards and gardens from nurseries we trust and believe in. We can sponsor a scholarship for a permaculture design course. We have the greatest ability to change the world when we work together and use the skills, knowledge, and resources that we have in abundance. Folks like Amanda, Joshua, and myself are here to help you find a way to make a difference in a way that matters and speaks to you. If you know someone engaged in work you believe in or have your own permaculture farm or project, please let me know so I can continue to curate that information and make it available to other listeners. Email show at the permaculturepodcast.com. You can also use that email address if you have any questions for me or if you think I can help you get connected to resources that will aid you or your project. From here, the next interview is another live conversation, this time recorded with Michael Judd to discuss his work and the latest book, For the Love of Paw Paws, a mini-manual for growing and caring for pawpaws, from seed to table. 
After that are two episodes with one of the co-founders of Permaculture, David Holmgren. Until the next time, use your resources in restoration of degraded lands while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other. 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 And each other.